I land from Birmingham and Austin around five o'clock, get the call around eight, then have to drive to San Antonio, make practice the next day. So it's a lot of traveling. Alizé Johnson had a wild Monday after the Spurs called him up in Big Board Sports. The shorthanded Spurs will try to end their eight-game losing streak when they play at the Thunder tonight. Jakob Pertl and Jeremy Sohan are already listed as out due to injuries. And now the Spurs say Josh Richardson is a no-go because of a right ankle sprain. Yesterday, the Spurs announced they signed forward Alizé Johnson and waived Jordan Hall. Johnson played in four preseason games of San Antonio this year before joining Austin October 15th. Now in his fifth NBA season and his sixth NBA team, Johnson is ready to help the Spurs win. You know, I took a lot of things from a, a lot of teams I, I played on. Uh, just staying ready, um, you know, being a pro, uh, most important thing, just being around, you know, guys that I've been around. And then, you know, with the group that we have here, um, you know, a couple of vets on this team, Jay Rich, Doug, and, uh, you know, Georgie, it's just, uh, it's just nice to be around some experience and then, you know, learn with some of the, you know, younger guys that are here um, to develop into, you know, NBA players that we're trying to be. Thunder will host the Spurs tonight at 7. UTSA is getting ready to host North Texas for the Conference USA Championship. UTSA is riding a nine-game winning streak and is ranked number 23 in the AP poll and 24 in the coaches poll. Back in late October, the Roadrunners beat the Mean Green 31-27 at the Alamo Dome, scoring the game-winning touchdown with 15 seconds to go. Frank Harris to JT Clark. The Roadrunners had their hands full with the UNT offense that day, and Brandon Brown knows it won't get any easier this time around. They're a good offense. I know that um, we're going to get there all. I mean, it's a championship game. We got we got to expect everything. Um, we know we know we're going to get everything like in, anything in the playbook that's possible. We're just looking to get on top of that with our film and make sure we're locked in on that. Kick us Friday night, 630 at the Dome. UNT head coach Seth Luttrell said it's going to be a very intense atmosphere. Over at Incarnate Word, the Cardinals will host Furman University in the second round of the FCS playoffs. Seven seed and Cardinals are coming off of a first round bye. Last season, the Cardinals went 10 and three, advancing to the second round behind quarterback Cameron Ward, who passed for nearly 4,700 yards with 47 touchdown passes. But after the season, he transferred out to join coach Morris at Washington State. So this season, UIW is 10 and one so far, led by quarterback Lindsey Scott Scott Jr., who's thrown for 3,800 yards with 50 touchdown passes. Wide receiver Taylor Grimes was asked why they adapted to Lindsey so quickly. I think some Lindsey brought to our team, not just obviously our whole team, is his, his leadership. And uh, he's a guy you can get behind. Uh, he's a hard worker. He's, you know, he's the hardest worker on our team. Uh, he's, really, he's really good in the film room, uh, so getting together with him. And, and he's just he's an easy guy to get behind. Winners of seven straight, UIW will host Furman Saturday, 1 p.m. at Gale and Tom Benson Stadium. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Two weeks into Pro Bowl voting, Seattle Seahawks rookie cornerback Tariq Woolen leads all NFL corners and fan votes. As of Monday, Reek had 58,633 votes. Fellow rookie Sauce Gardner leads AFC corners with 46,581 votes. So Woolen from UTSA has five interceptions this season, second best in the NFL, one behind leader C.J. Gardner Johnson. How about that rookie putting on a show? Mm -hmm. Just one of many UTSA grads that yes. are doing great in the NFL. Indeed. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. What you need to know about RSV and flu in kids and what has been an unusual cold and flu season so far. Yeah, after the break, the doctor is in. You have seen the headlines, stories around the country about hospitals at limited capacity because of a lot of children dealing with serious respiratory illnesses in what's turned out to be an unusual cold and flu season. So what do you need to know? We're going to talk about that today with inf pediatric infectious disease doctor, Dr. Tess Barton from UT Health. Always a pleasure to have you here. You always give us good insight. So let's talk first about what you are seeing here locally. We're hearing a lot about flu and RSV in particular. Sure, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so we are seeing actually tons of RSV and tons of flu. So RSV is a respiratory virus and it surges every year. Um, families with young babies have to deal with it and, and around this time of the year. It's been a bad RSV season. We've seen a lot more than usual. and We've seen really sick kids with RSV. Um, and on top of that, we're actually having an early flu season. So RSV and flu 
came together this year instead of one after the other like they normally do. Are you seeing COVID at all? What are we seeing with the COVID numbers right now? You know, COVID has been at a little bit of a lull um, where we've, it's been kind of stable, but relatively low. But in the past week or two, we're actually seeing more COVID. If you're a parent and you're sitting at home right now, what advice would you give them for when is a good time to take your child in to get seen? Whether it's to, uh, you know, what's the difference between setting up an appointment with your pediatrician and deciding I need to go to the emergency room? Sure. Well, um, so these viruses are very similar in that they cause, you know, lots of respiratory secretions and coughing and fever and, 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 and upper respiratory illness. Sometimes they can cause a lower respiratory illness, which can be a little bit like a pneumonia. So for parents, if your child is struggling to breathe, breathing fast, using lots of extra extra muscles or the little nasal flaring, um, making a lot of noisy breathing, struggling to catch their breath or can't can't even breathe well enough to latch onto the bottle. Those are times when they really ought to go see their pediatrician or even go to the emergency room. Uh, a sign that you and I have talked about too in that struggle to breathe is looking at their ribs, right? Noticing kind of their bellies. What should parents be looking for in the real little ones when it comes to that? That's right. So babies, when they're struggling to breathe, they try to use all their muscles to get those lungs open. And so that even includes the muscles that are, you know, in their neck above their above their their clavicles. It includes their right at the bottom of their ribs. You'll see them like their bellies will be going up and down. You know, they'll be sucking in here, you know, as they're trying to use every possible muscle to get their lungs moving. And those are warning signs for for serious respiratory distress. What are you seeing as far, are we seeing any lessening in the RSV or the flu numbers uh, from weeks past? Because I know that this has been something that, that, that the healthcare community has been dealing with for months now. And we do track our viruses on a weekly basis. Um, RSV has been pretty much holding steady, hanging around. We've had a little bit of a downtick of flu, which is which is hopeful and encouraging. But of course, as I mentioned, we're having a little bit of an uptick in COVID now. And why is this such an unusual season for cold and flu? Because we know that typically this time of year, we know to expect it, but we haven't really seen numbers like this where hospitals are, you know, in some cases having to turn people away. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes sometimes the viruses just have a different season. I think this time we're all sort of speculating that, you know, during during COVID, we were a little bit more cautious about what we did and where we went and we were wearing masks. And then when we've put all of those aside as we're entering winter virus season, you know, we don't have a lot of immunity from the past couple of years to all of those things. And so, you know, rather than kind of building a little bit of immunity to help keep us from getting ser serious illness, you know, it's kind of hitting us all at once. I want to ask about treatment because especially for kids, I mean, we know that they're going to be exposed to other children in schools, at daycares. It's going to happen. Kids are going to get sick and there's often a, not a lot you can do in terms of giving them something. So what can parents do to mitigate these symptoms that are often really similar for both flu and RSV? So the mainstay of, of any res respiratory virus illness, regardless of the virus, is lots of good hydration and, and clearing out nasal secretions, you know, get, getting that little blue rubber suction bulb and clearing things out or rinsing out, spraying the nose to try to get a lot of that mucus out so that you can breathe better. There is an antiviral treatment for the flu. Um, and so if you go to the doctor and get a test for the flu and it's positive, you can get treatment for the flu. And of course, we have prevention for flu and and for COVID um, with vaccines. And so, you know, uh, it, it's be great just to prevent getting it in the first place um, as much as possible. When it comes to testing, I mean, you're talking about it to me, the layman, you can correct me, feel free. But it, it, when we're talking about RSV and the flu and COVID, they all kind of have the similar symptoms and they kind of sometimes present in the, in the same way. If you have some of these, should you test for COVID? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. You know, I wish we had home tests for RSV and for flu. That would be handy. Um, but we do have home tests for COVID. And so that may be one way that you can kind of figure out a little bit what virus it is. Um, and of course, most pediatricians offices have rapid tests for for these viruses as well. 
Dr. Barton, before we let you go, you and Steve both know I have dealt with serious RSV yes. in my house in the last couple of months, so I've learned a lot about it. And something that I want to make sure people understand is sort of the timeline of that illness because it gets worse before it gets better. That's right. So RSV um, typically builds with kind of worsening mucus, worsening cough um, for the first three or four days, and that's when it hits its peak. So, um, so that's you know really when when parents need to be on the lookout for a lot of those warning signs. Um, because it will get worse before it gets better. And there are so many people out there right now dealing with RSV in their children or in themselves. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tess Barton, always appreciate your time with UT Health San Antonio. Have a good evening. You, you as too. well. We'll be right back. A Monday through Thursday work schedule would be a win-win situation. That is the finding of a new six-month study. Researchers with the nonprofit Four Day Week Global say that average revenue rose nearly 40% compared to the same period the year before with a five-day schedule in place. The workers themselves also liked the schedule change, saying they felt less stress and burnout. Now, the findings are based on 903 employees from 33 companies who made the schedule change with no change in pay. Few of the companies involved in the study said they planned on actually keeping the four-day schedule, at least for now. A separate six-month study in the United Kingdom by four-day week global just wrapped up. Those results expected early next year. Look outside with live cam this evening. The chill is back at least for a little while. Now we're going to see how long it stays. It's going to be even cooler tomorrow, Myra. I'll tell you that. You'll need the jacket, and you know what would be nice to have to measure how cool it is? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And I'm talking about this because it's the annual big thermometer ornament giveaway, all completely handmade and in different designs, the boot, the Texas, the Alamo. Uh, the second winner today, Robert Lee Lopez Jr. of San Antonio. You'll be hearing from me very shortly. You know, going through this evening, temperatures falling down to the 40s, less wind. You'll feel the chill in the air tomorrow, especially in the morning, then up and down temperatures and an upside down day we have to talk about on Saturday. In the buzz today, Netflix trying to recapture some of the buzz from a fan favorite show from the 90s and the early 2000s. The streaming company releasing a sequel series to that 70s show, a hit sitcom set in the 70s. The sequel is that 90s show. It takes place two decades later and features the children of the teenagers from the original. Yeah, Kurtwood Smith and Deborah Jo Rupp, who played parents in the original series, now play grandparents with a new crop of youngsters hanging out in the basement. Ashton Kutcher, Mila Kunis, and other stars from the original series are only seen in one of the new show's 10 episodes. That 90s show premieres on Netflix January 19th. Grandparents have an age. Yes. About that. A unique honor has been given to a French dining staple. The French baguette now has UNESCO World Heritage status. The organization describes the expertise behind the French bread as an integral part of human culture. This is something that French President Emmanuel Macron has previously been pushing for. He says he wants the baguette protected. The baguette is not the only food with UNESCO World Heritage status. Neapolitan pizza and Arabic coffee also on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. Why the baguette? Why not the croissant? Why not the omelet? These are all burning <laughs> questions that Steve has. Why, why not the fries? Uh -huh. Why not the fries? <laughs> you want to do it. Go ahead and do it, Go Kasky. Uh -huh. no, okay. <laughs> I didn't want you to hold that in. No, uh -uh, I can't. <laughs> he was over here the whole time while we were. That's true. Ready to read I don't this know that he it. was the only one. Well, I might have <laughs> joined in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Your microphone was on. Mine wasn't. That was yeah. the difference. Yeah. All right. So we've got uh, lots to talk about here this evening. Temperatures cooling off pretty quickly. We're 54 right now. By 9 p.m., we're going to be down into the upper 40s. And then tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., we're in the lower 40s. So a chill in the air tomorrow. Clear sky through this evening and tonight. But that's going to change quickly tomorrow. Take a look at some of our headlines and what you can expect. Um, some fog and drizzle will be back in the forecast as early as 
Friday morning. Okay, you'll be noticing that for sure that dampness will be back. Temperatures will be up and down quite a bit. 47 right now in Kerrville, 46 in Fredericksburg. Meanwhile, 60 in Catula, Laredo at 61. So ranging from the 40s to near 60, but we're all going to level off down closer to 40 tomorrow morning. Castroville now at 55 and Gonzales at 51. So tomorrow morning plan for right near 40 degrees. You'll feel that chill at the bus stop in the morning. Sweatshirts, jackets for the kids. Comfort 36, Bandera 39. New Braunfels about 39 along with Seguin. Then by the afternoon, we only make it into the mid, maybe upper 50s. Uh, 55 in Bernie, 60 in Floresville, very briefly 60. Uh, 59 in Poteet and about 55, 56 around San Antonio. So tomorrow's a cool day. You'll want the long sleeves, the jacket. Friday, you won't need it. See warmer temperatures, upper 60s. Saturday, things change again. Temperatures will drop throughout the day. So it's going to be one of those days where, where it'll be warmer in the morning than it will be in the afternoon and the afternoon temperature should dip into the upper 50s. But once we get to Sunday and especially next week, we're looking at some above average temperatures, especially starting on Monday we will be well into the 70s. Uh, dew points right now pretty dry, pretty low dew points currently in the 20s and 30s because of that dry northeasterly wind and it was a gusty northeasterly wind, but the wind is starting to subside, just leaving in its wake and leaving in its place this cooler, drier air and this dry air is what helps us really cool off efficiently and very quickly at night. So dew points in the 20s now, dew points are going to be up and down quite a bit along with high temperatures. Dew points will be bouncing around uh, over the next few days. Another dry day in terms of the dew point 32 but then by Friday we get that moisture back from the Gulf of Mexico and that's one reason why Friday Saturday and even Sunday and Monday we'll have some areas of fog drizzle and dampness because we'll have that low level moisture coming back in from the Gulf of Mexico and remember the, this time of year we have our longest nights the longer your night is the longer the opportunity the atmosphere has to develop that fog you know, the sunlight is what burns it off, but we don't have as much of it. Then uh, you're, you're prone to fog this time of year, especially with that Gulf moisture. Uh, big pattern shows a dip in the upper level flow Pacific Northwest. Another one in the northeastern US and even parts of the Great Lakes. Those two systems staying far away from us. Actually, we have an upper level high up little blue age, not a big blue age, but a little blue age that's over the Gulf of Mexico. And it's really going to keep our weather fairly uneventful. Yeah, nuisance moisture, but no good rainfall. Check out our future future cast. This is a good example. Increasing clouds and by early tomorrow morning, I do think we'll have just overcast sky. It's going to be the case through the afternoon. Then tomorrow night, little pockets of very light rain. We're talking sprinkles starting to develop mixed in with the fog and areas of drizzle, but actual rain chances uh, looking pretty slim, 20 to 30%. And even then it would be pretty light. So a cloudy day tomorrow will be in the 40s in the morning by the afternoon. We'll make it to 55. That's it. But remember next week we're in the 70s again. All righty. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. Hey, good morning to you, everyone. It is Wednesday. It is November 30th. San Antonio police say it may not be a coincidence. Fire broke out overnight outside two different businesses in the medical center, both within minutes of each other and just a few blocks apart. Fire crews quickly put that out, but not before it did quite a bit of damage outside. Officers say they caught a man there and took him into custody. A man involved in a shootout with Floresville police has now died. Texas Rangers are still investigating. DPS says the chase began near Floresville High School, then crossed the street towards the back of this rent-a-center. People who live in this RV park tell us that they heard gunshots coming from this direction. They saw Flores and officers chasing him. He went around the trailers and into that green space where they heard more gunshots and the chase ended there. Neighbors say they had seen Flores prior to the shooting and he appeared to be mentally unstable. After his capture and arrest, Juan David Ortiz was taken to a Webb County Sheriff's Office substation. Investigators were wanting to know if he is behind the murders of two women and the attack of another in September 2018. This is the first time the jury is seeing this interrogation video as Ortiz is interviewed 
for almost 10 hours, which is expected to play almost in its entirety. Boy, have people stepped up. Here at KSAT, we want to extend a huge thank you and gratitude to our viewers for helping us not only reach our goal, but exceed it. Team KSAT has raised more than $26,000 for the No Shave November fundraiser. The money raised will go to 13 different cancer foundations. To be I want to give you another look here at this big traffic tie up. This is the camera at I-37 and Fair Avenue, but this accident is near Steve's. Really all of this is right near I-35 and I-37. That interchange it has got traffic down to one lane. You can see off on the uh, access road there. Traffic is also backed up as well because of what's going on here. All right, a lot going on here in the seven day forecast. Uh, generally, cloudy pattern is going to take control for the next several days, and that's going to turn into some more fog, drizzle, and dampness. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, even into Monday, especially those mornings. Temperatures all over the place. 40 in the morning tomorrow, 50s by the afternoon. Then we're back in the 60s on Friday, only to cool off again Saturday. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for watching. <laughs> we'll see you next time.